Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to today's VIC stream session. Do I talk into this thing? Gandhi and broadcasting. Do I talk into this, this thing? These were the first words ever broadcast live, albeit inadvertently by Mohandas Gandhi ahead of his speech to the USA. The year was 1931 and the location, London. Gandhi was in town as a sole representative of the Indian National Congress to attend the second roundtable conference. He was just weeks shy of his 62nd birthday. Today's talk by historian Chandrika Kaul will focus on Gandhi and the radio, a subject that has been curiously neglected both in studies of Gandhi and of broadcasting. Gandhi's engagement with radio, the circumstances surrounding his broadcasts and his interaction with broadcasters will be analyzed to help situate the medium within the Mahatma's media repertoire and evaluate its impact. Following the lecture, Chandrika will be in conversation with former Secretary of Culture and former CEO of the Prasar Bharati, Jahar Sarkar. The bio of both the speakers will appear on the chat box that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, through the session, you, if you have any questions, comments, or observations to share with the speakers, you may use the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, next to the chat box. And uh, now over to Mr. Sarkar. Good evening, friends. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to be uh, stimulating a discussion, saying a couple of words about radio and Chandrika Call. Now, uh, Chandrika Call, as you'll see from her bio given to you, has been, uh, is teaches at St. Andrews University in Scotland and has been uh, avidly doing her work, research on the media, focusing uh, at times on the Indian media in the imperial era or the early uh, post-independence period. Now, she's done a lot of work and groundwork, and uh, I commend her because this uh, subject is uh, devastated by the lack of proper records. Uh, the Imperial Archives or the National Archives of India today still do not have too much on it. I know because I have uh, tried to find out a lot and Xerox, so Xerox a bit. So uh, he uh, he has, uh, I mean, uh, this this institution has uh, not been able to preserve too much of this the period in which uh, Chandrika has worked. There are some writings, but Chandrika has actually filled in a large gap, and this gap relates to Gandhi and the media not just the Indian media in, the in terms of radio and the print media. There was no television at that time, but Gandhian media. Now, Gandhi's uh, crafting of his own narrative, which becomes the national narrative, has been discussed many a time, that how he led the narrative on. And uh, we have a lot of work. But with the specific topic of Gandhi, how he related to the media, name or here, how he related to the radio setup, All India Radio, uh, there's been very little work. In fact, uh, one or two among the pieces that I've read is one is Pinkerton's, Zinta. There are some work, but they have their different focus. Now, I won't stand between you and Chandrika, but I would request Chandrika to, to sort of uh, fashion the talk on three pillars. First of all, Gandhi's first ad address on radio, uh, which was to the American radio. It was conducted by both uh, Chicago Herald and Associated Press from London. He was tackling a completely new medium on, sept on September 13th, I think. 1931. Uh, the Indian radio was still floundering at that time. Radio in India was floundering at that time. So, 31 means that uh, the radio in Britain and America were uh, quite ahead. Uh, so, that's the first address, how he dealt with it. The second address was again in September, but 1947. 
just after independence when severe riots had broken out all over Punjab and refugees had poured into Kapurthala, uh, no, sorry, into, into Kurukshetra and Gandhi had decided to pacify them. He was stopped at the border, he was stopped at Delhi's border, told not to proceed and instead he decided to come to All India Radio for the first time in his life. So this, these two are the pillars. And third, while he's, she's talking about it, she could as well think of giving us a pen picture of how the radio functioned during that period. I mean, the radio was still in its various stages of infancy and childhood. It would become a very powerful weapon in Europe by the mid-30s when the Nazis started using it. When Churchill realized its great importance, but in India, it was still, uh, I put it, a football being tossed by a very independent controller and his successors and the Imperial Raj. In other words, between the uh, professionals of All India Radio and the bureaucrats of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, whom I had the pleasure of being uh, dealt rather unfairly. So between the bureaucrats on the one hand and between the professionals on the other, they did produce a lot of uh, material for history. So Chandrika's book, which she has edited, deals mainly on this subject. And Chandrika's own chapter on it focuses on Gandhi. Now over to you, Chandrika. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Namaskar and good evening to everyone mm -hmm. in India. Um, it's such a delight uh, to be here and thank you to the Bangalore International Center and to Johar for so kindly hosting this talk. I'm going to um, adhere to uh, Johar's requests um, and speak for about you know, 25 minutes or so, um, broadly along the lines of what he said, i.e. focusing on Gandhi's own uh, contributions and interaction with radio. However, in my work and in, in this book um, that Jawhar mentioned, which has just been published, I do talk about the development of all India radio. Uh, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So I hope to touch upon that, but I won't focus on that in my talk, but perhaps I could uh, get back to some of the details um, in the post-lecture discussion. So as I think everybody knows, uh, Gandhi was a, a master publicist. Uh, we have had numerous biographers who have attested to his skills at using media. But it is very interesting and striking that when it comes to broadcasting and radio, he only ever made two live broadcasts, one in September 1931 and the second in November 1947, and Dohar has touched on both of them. But how do we explain this anomaly? And why is it that Gandhi chose not to engage much more? It's not as if Indians were totally off All India Radio, as it were, or didn't engage with it. So, for example, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sarojini Naidu, um, and Amrit Kaur, uh, for example, um, before the Second World War, were broadcasting on economic and social issues on All India Radio. Of course, Rabindranath Tagore very famously embraced uh, radio. And in fact, when the shortwave uh, station was established in Calcutta, it was Tagore who wrote a poem called Akash Vani to celebrate this event. And of course, that was then adopted as the formal title uh, by, by, the, by the Indians after independence to refer to broadcasting. 
And of course, during the Second World War, we do have um, most dramatically Subhas Chandra Bose, who was broadcasting, albeit from uh, Germany uh, to India, but nevertheless using the medium. And during the Quit India uh, Revolution in 1942, we also had a very short-lived uh, clandestine Congress radio network that was broadcasting. So going back to Gandhi, in the night, very, very briefly, in the 19, late 1920s, when All India Radio, but it wasn't called All India Radio then, it was called the Indian Broadcasting uh, Company, was established, Gandhi did interact with the British controller, a chap called Eric Dunstan. He met him in Bombay and, and seemingly had discussions about uh, radio. But we don't have evidence of any further development uh, based on this interest of Gandhi's. And it's only in 1931 when Gandhi comes to London to attend the second roundtable conference that he is persuaded by his American journalist friends, I should say, but those who were following him, for example, people like William Shirer, who represented the Chicago Herald Tribune and covered Gandhi's uh, no civil disobedience movement, or Jim Mills, who represented uh, news agencies, again, American news agencies, and covered um, aspects of the civil disobedience movement in 1930. It was because Gandhi had this relationship with American journalists, that when he reached London, he was persuaded uh, to make his first ever live broadcast to, uh, to America. Um, and this happened in 1931, uh, um, in September, uh, on the 13th to be precise. And it is very interesting, and I write in detail about how Gandhi, um, you know, accepted this invitation and then how he engaged with the medium. You know, he comes in five minutes late. People are biting their nails because this is live radio. But he walks in calmly five minutes um, after the scheduled time, sits down, and then without realizing that the mic was live, he makes that remark, do I speak into this thing? So that is the first uh, sentence that his audience, particularly in America, ever hear of Gandhi. Um, and it's very interesting because afterwards, you know, there are lots of letters that arrive uh, in London from America talking about about the broadcast. But, but before I come to that, so, so basically, what does Gandhi say? Now, it's very interesting. Gandhi, as is well known, uh, doesn't speak from written notes. He's usually extempore. And so he is on uh, this first broadcast too. He sits down, composes himself, and then talks uh, beautifully and evocatively uh, about the movement for independence in India. But what I found very interesting, and again, I mean, there's a lot I could oh. say, but time is short. But what I found really interesting in this first broadcast that he gave was the use repeatedly of the word world, uh, globe, uh, you know, the idea, uh, and he says it, that what we or the Indians and he is looking for is the support of the world in India's struggle. So it is absolutely clear that he is focusing on the creation, if you like, of a global message. Um, and in turn, he himself is becoming this global Gandhi. Now, of course, this broadcast is not the first time he does this. He does this during the Salt March in 1930. And again, I've written about that as well. And particularly about the impact of that Salt March in the West, in America and in London. So Gandhi is very aware that there is a backdrop to this. He is speaking 
to, if you like, friends, those who he feels are on his side and on the side of the movement he is trying to wage in India. So he is speaking to the converted. And I think this is reflected in his confidence, in the way he articulates his message on, um, on the radio on this occasion. Now, briefly, it is, um, you know, for its time, very successful. And I based this on fact on very, you know, I won't go into the detail, but essentially newspapers reproduce the, um, the, the, the speech verbatim. Uh, his uh, secretary, Mahadev Desai, uh, writes about how every week uh, the mailbox is inundated by letters. Uh, you know, from America and, 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 you know, and so there is plenty of um, evidence, um, both written from the media and also some anecdotal evidence that Gandhi's broadcast is successful. Now, very briefly, what happens when Gandhi goes back to India? Well, essentially what's happening in India in the second half of the 1930s is that the government has now taken over broadcasting. And in 1935, we have the birth of the so-called All India Radio, as it's then christened. And this is put in, the person who's put in charge of this is a former BBC um, employee, a chap called Lionel Fielden. And I write in my work about the relationship between Fieldson and Gandhi and how over the next few years, Fieldson tries but fails to persuade Gandhi to use uh, the media. Um, and I think I will, in the conclusion, I will go through why I think uh, Gandhi doesn't, um, particularly because, as I mentioned earlier, people like Nehru, um, Sarojini Naidu and others at this time in the late 30s do use uh, the medium. Uh, but it is quite interesting because Fielden himself is very sympathetic to the nationalist cause, but of course, as the controller of All India Radio, he cannot take sides. But he's very aware that the government of India, the British Raj, uh, technically, uh, theoretically, talks about the freedom of the airwaves, but in actual fact, uh, puts in so many regulations that effectively there is no political access to the airwaves for Indians. So even after the, the 1935 Government of India Act, which in, interestingly has a section uh, for the first time on communications and on broadcasting. But it makes it very clear that the way the airwaves are not to be used for political uh, messaging, political propaganda. So in 1937, when the Congress and other, and the League and other uh, you know, Indian parties are engaging in uh, electioneering, if you like, um, they are not allowed to use the airwaves. Now, in the 1940s, during the war, of course, again, very briefly, uh, there is a, a huge resurgence of uh, the government's interest in developing All India Radio, as well as uh, the BBC broadcasts to India. I'm working on a different book on these issues. So I think what I can say at this point is that there is a great deal of money put into it, obviously for war propaganda reasons, um, and particularly after 1942, when of course the threat from Japan is so uh, insistent and is so worrying. Um, but of course, as we all know, in 1942, we have the Quit India Movement and for two years, um, uh, at least Gandhi for two years, uh, is imprisoned. Um, he's released in 44, but most of the other leaders are not. Um, so even if they wanted to, they simply couldn't access the airwaves, um, apart from Subhash Bose and others I mentioned earlier. So after the war, when the writing is on the wall, as it were, for the Raj, we begin to see a change when it comes to broadcasting too. But Gandhi is not willing, even at this stage, 
to engage with the medium. When Lord Mountbatten finally uh, comes in as the last Viceroy in 1947, we begin to see a very dramatic difference in the engagement of more political uh, or more Indian politicians, if you like, directly with radio. And the reasons for this are complex. I've written about it elsewhere. It's partly to do with the fact that the British know they're leaving. It's partly to do with the fact that Mountbatten himself is a, a, a keen, um, he's very keen on, um, on publicity, on propaganda, and on using the media, particularly for projecting his own image. Uh, but also, I think he feels that that helps him in his diplo in his diplomacy with Indians. So there are complex um, political uh, reasons and also personal reasons why things in the final months of the British Raj begin to change on the ground. But even now, Gandhi refuses to engage directly with the media. Um, in 1946, to give you an example, Sardar Patel, uh, becomes uh, the uh, Minister of Communications and Information and Broadcasting, actually, um, in, uh, in the interim government. So this is before independence. And Patel uh, discusses this with Gandhi. And we do have evidence that I quote in my work. But Gandhi says to Patel in Gujarati, uh, he says, uh, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to engage with this medium because the people I want to reach don't have access to radio in India. These are the poor in the villages and so on. So I'll come, come to this in a moment when I'm concluding, but again, we get an insight uh, into why Gandhi is holding back even at this late stage. Now, this does not mean that Gandhi's speeches are not being recorded now. Uh, they are increasingly being recorded as are indeed other people other Indian speeches, and they are being relayed on All India Radio by, by the British in India. There are Indians, of course, in All India Radio too, but the British are still in charge of policy. And particularly after independence, during the whole crisis with the partition of the subcontinent and so on, we do see Gandhi allowing his messages, his uh, post-prayer speeches, um, his speeches in Bengal. Uh, if you all know, you know, he goes to Bengal, that's where he is when independence occurs. He's not in Delhi. Uh, he's allowing um, uh, broadcasters and uh, broadcast journalists to interview him and also to record his speeches for transmission on All India Radio. But it's only in November, as Johar mentioned at the beginning, that we find Gandhi taking to the airwaves in a live broadcast. And of course, the content of that broadcast on the 13th um, of November is all about uh, the crisis to do with partition, the dislocation, the communal uh, dangers, and so on. So, you know, he is spreading his message. He's, he's doing it because, as George said, you know, he's not physically able to do, th do it any other way. So, so that is the second major broadcast. But as I said, you know, it's not as if All India Radio is not now recording his speeches. In fact, in my article, I have a very poignant um, recollection of Mr. Madan, who is one of the All India Radio technicians, who is present on the grounds, um, you know, in the grounds of Birla House on that fateful evening, uh, you know, of 30th January 1948. Um, he's there setting up his mics, uh, waiting you know, setting up all the recording, um, waiting for Gandhi to come. And he writes about how he's looking at his uh, recording equipment and looking up at Gandhi and watching him coming, you know, just about to set things up when he hears the fatal shots being fired. Um, and actually, just before I, I come to my conclusion, a few uh, uh, days before um, the, the fatal shooting, of course, as you all know, there had been another attempt um, at a, a bomb that was placed near the grounds of Gandhi's um, 
Gandhi's prayer meeting in Birla House. And it is very poignant how we do have tapes of, um, of, that, of that moment and of Gandhi trying to pacify the crowds when the bomb goes off, um, telling them to calm down. And it is rather poignant that we do have that recorded because all in the radio technicians, you know, were in the grounds. Okay, so let me, um, I hope I wasn't speaking too fast, but, you know, I, I realized that I had all these notes that I haven't looked at. But what I want to do now is perhaps to offer a few concluding reflections when, um, if you'll forgive me, I will um, uh, look at some of my, my notes to try and pull some of my ideas together. It is tempting to consider the counterfactual, the success Gandhi may well have enjoyed had he engaged with radio as a social reformer from before the war. Might Gandhi have been able to put his message of rural reconstruction, primary education, and removal of, of untouchability? Might he have been able to put this across more efficiently? After all, Gandhi um, was continually using oh, new God. media forms throughout his career from the time he was in South Africa when he began using the telegraph so effectively right through to 1933 when he established his last new journal, the Harijan. He did that with the similar motive of propagation. So why didn't he do it? When Fielden asked him on one occasion, uh, he replied to Fielden, why should I help a machine which will be used against me. Now, of course, we know in India, the government's control over AIR was markedly different from that exercised over the press. Now, the Raj had quickly realized the fallacy of establishing an official newspaper. It would simply not be taken seriously by anyone, least of all by their own countrymen. And therefore, the Raj found it far more effective to combine indirect persuasion, disguised subsidies to newspapers and Reuters, with fines and legal restrictions, which they enshrined in their press acts, to try and control the print media and to serve and to make it serve imperial interests. Thus, newspapers in India enjoyed a far greater latitude under the Raj because there was no mileage in having a state-controlled press. And because the British had managed over several decades to construct a workable model of persuasion with control. And in the final analysis, endemic mass illiteracy effectively curtailed, they thought, the direct impact of newspapers. But of course, the broadcast model in India was both very new and inherently very different, um, as, of course, the experience of the, internet, uh, the, the IBC and EIR demonstrated. Despite having the blueprint of the BBC to work from, the project of private broadcasting, as represented by the IBC, and public broadcasting, as embodied in All India Radio, was found to be practically, financially, and ideologically incompatible with the ethos of the Raj. The collapse of the IBC in 1930 and its government takeover spelt the death knell for any incipient nationalist aspirations for radio. Bernard Cohn has argued, and several other people too, that the conquest of India was a conquest of knowledge. The Raj bureaucrats were aware of the soft power that control over the mass media 
would give the imperial state, as indeed were their nationalist opponents like Gandhi. Imperial rule depended essentially on a monopoly of information, the acquisition of knowledge, and control over its interpretation. Broadcasting, when compared to the press, was far more lethal as a medium of influence, as it had a greater reach and it was not impeded by illiteracy. When it appeared that the airwaves over India could potentially spread the contagion of opposition, the Raj took preemptive measures to ensure that the battle between strategic control and freedom of expression was over before a single shot had been fired. Officials, of course, were also aware of the increasing necessity of securing a good press during these years, not least because of the success of their opponents like Gandhi. Though the Raj attempted to censor foreign newspapers and news reports, it was not possible beyond the point to completely suppress this. And this is what uh, helped to explain the successful engagement of American journalists with Gandhi. How far can Gandhi's response to radio also be explained by his supposedly techno-skeptic mindset. In his early writings in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi had proclaimed all machinery to be bad. And throughout his life, he was confronted by the accusation that, that he was, in quotes, an arch enemy of machines. Also during a long career, Gandhi was occasionally contradictory, he was inconsistent in both rhetoric and praxis. He notably championed handicraft and manual labor. He often criticized the impact of industrialization. Arguably, Gandhi's belief in the sanctity of human labor, epitomized in the hand-spinning charkha, was also a recognition of the economic realities facing India's rural millions. And I believe is perfectly compatible with his appreciation of modern electronic technology. On one occasion, um, on the 13th of November, actually on 1947, on All India Radio, he characterized the power of radio as, in his words, Shakti divine power, which he felt was embodied in the virus. Further, Gandhi's conceptualization of the impact of machines and technology, as well as his vision of ethical economics, developed over time. You know, it's not static. It became more nuanced and sophisticated. As he, as he once said to a critic in 1934, and I'm quoting, we do want machines, but we do not want to become their slaves. We should make the machine our slave. During, uh, you know, and that's, um, again, I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing, over a lifetime, I, I believe Gandhi displayed a fascination with technology, with technology technological innovation from when he first set sail from India to come to England as a teenager. He was really impressed by modern steamship. He marveled at the Suez Canal. He was, uh, you know, he thought the electrification in London was fantastic. Um, and also, I think throughout his life, we see how he uses modern technology to communicate with not just his opponents, but with fellow nationalists. So, you know, using, for example, electric telegrams right from his South African days onwards. 
Um, I came across a very funny example how in 1944, after he's released from prison, uh, people think that, you know, Gandhi needs to relax and suggest that he should watch a film. You know, he was in, he was in Bombay and, and Gandhi's made, made to watch his first feature film in 1944, but he doesn't really enjoy that experience. Anyway, so, uh, you know, based on my research, one can, I don't think we can accuse Gandhi of being anti-deluvian and opposed to the cultural modernity represented by radio because of his refusal to interact fully with it. He appeared to follow radio developments in India and despite coming late to broadcasting in life, he did admire the global reach of wireless technology. Also, he was very happy to interact with individual broadcasters like Dunstan and Fielden. But he was averse to working with the institution of broadcasting under imperial constraints. I think this was in keeping with his general mantra. Gandhi was anti-Raj, not anti-British. Gandhi's reluctance to deliver live broadcasts from a studio may be characterized as idiosyncratic, but that ought not to be confused or conflated with an antipathy to radio. The ultimate aim of broadcasting, as understood by Gandhi, as well as by the BBC, was public service. But in the context of subjugated India, All India Radio was not fit for Gandhi's purpose. The chronic paucity of radio sets in India, but particularly in rural India, also convinced Gandhi that he could not reach the people who most needed his help. You know, the toiling masses, the poor, who were all beyond the pale of broadcasting. Gandhi, I believe, remained a utilitarian and technology had to serve a practical purpose within a suitable context. Thus, he exulted in the engineering marvel of the Suez Canal linking East and West, yet he found the Eiffel Tower in Paris overrated when he visited it for an exhibition in 1890. Evidence in my research suggests that Gandhi approached broadcasting in a similar fashion. But it's true, he also did not incorporate radio into his ideological worldview in the same way that he had print. I think this may well have been simply a matter of timing and access. It may also reflect the advantages that Gandhi saw the portability and accessibility that the press offered him. Dennis Dalton has argued that Gandhi was, and I quote, not primarily a theorist, but a reformer and an activist. As a politician, Gandhi's interaction with technology was often dictated by pragmatism. Gandhi throughout his life, remained shy and ill at ease with other media too, particularly, for example, the camera. Yet the Mahatma was no less a showman for his causes and cognizant of the power of the media to forge anti-imperial identities. He almost instinctively believed in the power of the image. And for instance, someone like Emma Tarlo has demonstrated this in connection with his sartorial choices. But whilst over his image and over the pen, Gandhi could exercise some measure of control over the airwaves, he emphatically did not. Ultimately, I believe what Gandhi's e interaction with broadcasting reveals is the necessity to acknowledge that influence of technology is linked 
to its historic specificity. That is what endows it with an explanatory power. Gandhi's frequent references in his speeches to myriad dialogic forms, letters, telegrams, telephone calls, press articles, news agency reports, and laterally also broadcasts, reveals what a consummate communicator Gandhi was and how he continued to have his finger on the pulse of the nation. And thus, for a communicator par excellence, it is perhaps a fitting tribute to Gandhi to have 12th November commemorated as the Jan Prasaran Divas, or the Public Service Broadcasting Day, as announced by the Indian government in 2000. Yet, to live up to the ideals Gandhi sought to propagate of and through the media is clearly proving to be far more challenging. Thank you. you Chandrika, see. that was a lovely talk. And uh, I would come back only for the sake of a bit of excitement in this whole subject to three markers, to three points of history. First is his speech in 1931 addressed to the American people. Now, let us not forget that America was the first country to be taking steps in broadcasting. In fact, the word broadcasting came from California because uh, the first radio engineer felt that spreading the word around was like what his papa had told him about spreading seeds. So broadcasting comes from a farming uh, lexicon, uh, lexicon. Okay, Americans were far ahead, and by 1930, he had made his splash through the Dandi March. He had chosen a metaphor, an item, a metaphor, I put it, salt, which meant a lot to the white world that was always starved of salt. Okay, by 31, he was a celebrity to the Western world that, let us say, uh, um, uh, Tagore had been uh, established, uh, let us say, about 18, 20 years ago. Okay, he was uh, establishing himself on the international stage so as to internationalize the cause of Indian independence. So let's move away from 31. 31, radio was struggling in India. Radio was struggling in India. 37 is a more interesting year. 35. Lionel Fielden comes in, the Dunstan period over, and Lionel Fielden is one of those over-enthusiastic, uh, hyper-energetic people who must do something. So he begins with a very noble task of cutting the bureaucracy to size, and the bureaucracy retaliates by cutting him to size. So they have a very interesting period, almost similar to what I had uh, <laughs> encountered. So, But we'll let that pass. I will let that pass. <laughs> so um, he, he writes that I fight, uh, I fight so frightfully with the deputy secretaries and secretaries. He doesn't know that there are many gods anyway. So 37 is more interesting because Fielden was in complete command. Fielden wanted the nationalists to come on radio. Fielden wanted to challenge the Raj bureaucrat by saying, I'm going to get them on social messaging. I don't want to allow them to talk politics. I know I'm a proper British. So he tried. And while Gandhi was keen to send people like uh, Rajkumari, Amritkar and others in, subsequently, he avoided. Now, that is a mystery we need to crack. Yes. 1937, at the height of Lionel Fielden's Raj regime, Sabraj, there were only 92,000 receiver sets in India. There were four stations only with limited beats. As you know, medium wave could go up to what 200 miles if it was powerful enough. Short wave could go longer with a crackly voice. So we had Bombay, Madras, Delhi, and Delhi was just opened last year, I mean, in 36, and Calcutta. There were two more stations, one at Lucknow, the other in Trichy. Yeah. These were the six. There were 11 transmitters at that point of time. So the reach was limited and the number of sets, receiver sets or radio sets as we call it, was 92,000. 
Gandhi knew it was not worth his while. Hmm. He knew and they were, they were speaking four to five languages. He knew it was not worth his in 1937. And so if he declined, if he gave a lot of advice to brother Field and telling him not to take things emotionally, these fights happen and things like that. He was doing it politely saying, like many people said to say to the English uh, television, that boss, you're not worth my trouble. You reach 0.04% of the population. So why are we talking about it? Right. Uh, it's, it's good to give feel good with people like us. PLUs yeah. sort of gladden us, but it's not worth it in politics. Yeah. So in 37, when he was in the height of his politics, contesting elections, trying to corner the Muslim League, trying to contest against the Hindu Mahasabha and winning, slashing the Muslim League and it's all Muslim dominated states, he was not going to use the radio. But in 47, it was a change scene. By then, technology had improved. Number of transmitters had gone up to 18. The sets were better. Sets were more. I think it was about 5 lakhs, which is quite a critical mass. So I would put it, I have read your work, that it was his calculation that it was not worth his while. Having said that, he did not ignore the radio as a medium. Mm. His technophobia did not go to any uncrossable limits. He was very clear in where he was get going, going at. Remember, it was very expensive. You've used the word recording, recording on a couple of occasions. I would put it like this, that they were temporary recordings. As you know, during that period, we don't have too much of archival recording which is a big gap in Indian history. The Absolutely. period before independence, we don't have archival recordings with great difficulty. Jinnah's speech was found out and presented to Pakistan. The August 1947 speech was found out. So we don't have too much because they were all recorded on uh, silver sheets. Yeah. They were done on silver discs, another very expensive medium. Yeah. And these were remolded and reused again and again. So we don't have the recordings of that period. Gandhiji was very clear that it had to be worth his while. That's what I'm saying. But why did he suddenly change in 47? By June 1947, it was clear that Jinnah and Nehru mattered more. That they would be leading it. Patel mattered more. And he was taking a voluntary retirement from politics but he wanted his voice to be heard. Yes. As you said about Noakhali, during the Noakhali or the Bengal period, the Belaghata period of 19 yeah. August 47, he wanted his voice to be heard. One way of doing it was to send old age Twitter, which was Telegram, which was also fond of using. Limited number of words, expensive, you send it. Yeah. Other one was to be quoted on radio. He had reached a stage where he considered himself not radio worthy, but court worthy. He was compelled to go to uh, All India Radio, Kingsway Camp, not on Parliament Street, not near the new Parliament building. No, no, not near yeah. the new Parliament building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on Kingsway Camp near Delhi University. Yeah. He was compelled to go there because of riots. And they worshipped that date. That's my way of looking at it. That's my yeah. way of looking at it. And uh, by 47, he needed to be in touch with a party that he had hoped to disband itself. Uh, many hope about, uh, many nurture the same hope, but then uh, nurture the same hope. But uh, he had uh, more or less made up his mind that since yeah. Up to 1945, it didn't matter to him. 46, it didn't matter to him. 47, it's best left to the youngsters. So that's the way I look at his interaction because as you have rightly pointed out, Gandhi was media savvy. Gandhi was politics savvy. Gandhi was success savvy. These are not, these are not faults. These are qualities that make a leader. Uh, he didn't believe at the last stage to have his monkey bath and all that. He kept it all to himself. But he was a great communicator. Yes. And 
that is the way I look at it. Now, I'd like your reaction to this before we move on to questions and answers about 15, 20 minutes later and 15 minutes later. Uh, thank you, Johar. Uh, I, you know, I, if you saw me, I was nodding vigorously while you were talking because I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm very grateful that mm. you brought up some of the details of my of my chapter, you know, where I talk about the things you, you know, I couldn't talk about, you know, the, the details about spread of All India Radio, the, the number of, um, you know, the, 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 the small number of small number of stations, the financial problems, and it was essentially running on a shoestring. And I think this in, it's very interesting, I think, because what you're suggesting is, is also what I have, am arguing, which is that really Gandhi, it wasn't anything to do with um, being a technophobe. It was everything to do with being a pragmatist and, and, being, and having so much, so many demands on his time that you know that he was willing to meet individuals because he was very kind and he always engaged and he saw himself as a journalist i'm writing a, a book about this you know i think it's really important to recognize uh, that you know while we might project onto gandhi uh, he himself at a very fundamental level saw himself um very proudly as um, a journalist you know as as, yes. as somebody who was you know, and, and he was very, he was proud of that profession. And I think there is something Victorian about that because he grew up, you know, his ideas about the role of media, including broadcasting, this idea, you know, of the BBC with public service, for example, it's very different, of course, uh, with, with in, in India and so on. Um, but the idea that Gandhi grew up with all, all late 19th century ideas, you know, ideas about the, the, the fourth estate, uh, the role of the press, the freedom of the press, you know, the idea of individual liberty and the right to talk about it and express it. And he was fundamentally convinced that uh, the, the liberal, uh, the liberal imperialists, if you like, um, the British, actually saw eye to eye with him. And to some extent, Gandhi was right. They did. I think they, they, they obviously, it wasn't as simple as that um, because uh, the, the empire, um, uh, you know, was very ambiguous about the whole notion of freedom of the press, um, particularly uh, when it came to uh, exporting it. Um, it was all very well in Britain, um, which is why they couldn't do anything in 1931 when Gandhi was in London under their noses broadcasting to America. Uh, but it is very interesting, and I've done, I'm writing about this. Um, it is very interesting that the BBC did not approach Gandhi at this point. You know, it, it because there were reasons for that, and I can't go into it. But anyway, so the idea is that Gandhi was very, very aware that what he was doing was cocking a finger up at the British. You know, he was there in the capital city, a guest um, of the Raj, and using the plat using the position of freedom that he could get in London to broadcast. So that goes to the heart of what you were saying too, the idea of um, being a pragmatist, being a communicator par excellence and weighing up his options. What worked best uh, for him, for his message, as much as for, for, uh, for, the, for the wider context. And I think you're absolutely right in 1947, and this is my final point, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I do talk about it in my chapter and I'm you know, going to expand on this. Is that by 1947, Gandhi, uh, though he had taken a step back very publicly, he still wanted to be counted. He still felt he had a message to give. And if you look at the contemporary newspapers, so many of them, Johar, led with Gandhi, even after independence and partition, the lead stories was about, well, what was Gandhi saying? Where was Gandhi? Not necessarily supporting him, you know, I mean, they were they were attacking him too. I mean, there were lots of, for example, comment um, after the refugees started pouring in, for example, in Delhi newspapers and newspapers in the Punjab, who were very critical of Gandhi. You know, there were people being quoted in the newspaper saying, 
what, the hell, what has Gandhi done for us? You know, it's because of Gandhi's position um, that we are in this mess. And let's not forget that, uh, you know, ultimately the person who succeeded in murdering him um, was um, was also a journalist. You know, he had his newspapers. He was he had uh, been upset by newspaper reports over months of what he thought was Gandhi favoring um, the other side against um, you know as he saw it his own people. So there is a way in which uh, the fact that Gandhi remains uh, relevant um, in the press. You know, he's constantly in the media. Uh, is linked both to, you know, his own activities, you know, he's protecting himself, but also, I think, because the media still think that he is father of the nation. It's absolutely, you know, the, and uh, having served uh, All India Radio for absolutely no fault of mine uh, for about <laughs> four and a half years, uh, in fact, a little more, uh, I still find the Prasar Bharati and uh, Akashwani uh, having the same uh, 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 schizophrenic uh, uh, way of looking at it. They can't make up their mind whether they are a watchdog or a lapdog. Of course, it's now decisively uh, decided what they are, but never mind. They, they, they had to contend against contend against pressures from the ministry, from the Raj, whatever Raj exists, whenever it exists. I was also part of it, so I know how the psyche functions. And the spirit of freedom and individuality. I think this was most profound in more than Dunstan, I find it most profound in Lion and Fadelin, Yes. who yes. left a few months before his tenure ended, something yes. that I right to ape in my own small way. But uh, there is a limit up to which you can put up with all this. Yes. But you have actually brought attention to a very unfocused area. You have put your torch on under the cupboard. And for that, I thank you that you have focused on an area. Let there be a debate on it because there are more evidence also that can come in. Yes. Uh, from, yes. In this way. And I think, Tandika, you might like to round off with a few words and then I think they'll put in the questions and answers. Well, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take questions now. I think you're absolutely right in your opening remarks when you talked about uh, the paucity of uh, surviving archival evidence. Uh, you know, I myself can, uh, can testify to that, um, having worked before the pandemic, um, you know, in archives in Delhi. Um, I would very much like to get back um, and visit, you know, Kol Kolkata and Mumbai and so on and, and, and see uh, what might be available. So this is a shout out to anybody who's listening in. Please feel free to get in touch with me if you have information about archives, because as George said, we cannot write and reconstruct the history without uh, reliable evidence. Thank you. The Indian listener, incidentally, has, has been archived. So you'll get a lot of material from the yes. Indian listener. Betar Jagat in yes. Calcutta has also been uh, archived. Uh, thank God it took a lifetime to do it. But, but anyway. Betar Jagat, that's in, that, is that in Bengali or Hindi? That's in Bengali. That's in Bengali. But, uh, but that can always be translated. You can put it into Google Translate and get some meaning out of it. Everything is run by Google, as you know, and by Twitter and by WhatsApp. So we, we, we can take certificates from there. And uh, mercifully, there are areas that are still in the, the gray area of freedom. Uh, I'll quote, I'll end by a particular line that I liked about Gandhi to a very worried Lionel Failden, the controller of broadcasting and de facto DG of All India Radio when he was yelling and crying, <laughs> he said, you know what? You are a milk and water liberal, whatever that means. Uh, some of us are accused of being same. Realize that you are, we are under an occupation army. Realize that we are facing a force and one has to take sides. One has to take sides. There's a limit to which milk and water liberals can proceed. Thank you very much. And uh, to the BIC organizers, uh, I think it's over to questioners and to Chandrika. Lekha. Yes.
thank you uh, for that fascinating lecture chandrika and uh, thank you for your insights mr sarkar um oh. i have a few questions i will uh, go through them rajnandini shaw asks why might mk gandhi is speaking only twice live on air in his lifetime uh be an anomaly and in what respect chandrika over to you um you mean anomaly yeah uh, sorry uh, an anomaly yes. yeah well, well only because he was such a prolific communicator you know he was constantly you know as i write in my book he was the news and he made the news you know it was both <laughs> and, and the fact that he didn't jump on the bandwagon because we mustn't forget as i think jawhar mentioned <coughs> this and i do write about it in my book that the 1930s in particular were a period when you can talk about the florescence of um radio as we understand it um you know historically uh, in the west um everywhere you looked uh, particularly in britain with the bbc uh, but also in america and of course we go back in history to looking at russian and and german and 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 other users of radio and it's it's all colored by the by the by the perspective you know of the of the second world war right i mean there is a lot uh, of ways in which broadcasting is tied up with this notion of um you know nazi propaganda and and how the germans used it and so on um but you know you only have to look at someone like subhash bose to see how effective the medium was um in reaching uh, reaching different constituencies and i find as johar was saying the fact that um gandhi did not take up several opportunities of coming on to the mic um albeit uh, for social and economic and other um um causes i find that um an anomaly uh, you know that's why i used it it's not that gandhi was unaware of broadcasting um his colleagues um like the go uh you know was constantly being asked and he was uh you know on on the airways um and uh nehru too um and um sarojini naidu um amrit kaur um patel later so it's not as if there were other there were not other major leaders who were using what limited access they had it, it was limited i totally understand that um but even within that parameter i find it quite interesting that uh, gandhi didn't do more um but of course uh, johar also talked very eloquently about why that might have been um and something that you know i wasn't able to bring out but i hope very much you will read uh, not just this book that you know i published in 2014 another book uh, where i talk in particular about 1930 31 you know the salt march and the coverage of gandhi by by american newspapers uh, to show you the kind of access gandhi had you know it's it's um it's it's quite interesting to see that even within the constraints of the raj gandhi was being offered opportunities um and he wasn't taking them um or he didn't take them at that point uh, so that's that's all um and and that's that's why i focused on you know on that so i hope that answers uh, partly what you were trying to to ask i'm sorry i can't see you but i hope <laughs> but i hope that helps um next question is from k jairaj how did gandhi become such a great communicator when it was unrehearsed impromptu and straight from the heart he was Isn't a lawyer <laughs> he was a lawyer to begin with absolutely Ad advocate mm. no go go ahead jahar and professors they make good speakers usually they have no option but to speak i mean not to become good speak you know when you were replying to gandhi's uh, let's say commandeering of the press in 1930 to make his international mark during the dandi march you may have noticed that his original plan of reaching the sea coast 
was horribly delayed or deliciously delayed. You can look at it either. Deliberately. deliberately delayed. Because when he found that the international press was coming and he was told, Bapuji, X is coming by tomorrow and made a fervent plea that you please uh, somehow mark time, Gandhiji would have obviously not listen to such mischievous advice. But somebody would come and tell him at that moment, Papuji, there is a village we have gone past where people have given up drinking. So Bapuji would say, that requires my congratulations. So he would walk back to a village and there you have the ultimate one day's delay. So Gandhiji knew about it and knew how the media mattered. Media mattered and Frankly, up to 45, 46, uh, see, from 41 onwards, or even from 39 onwards, it was a war radio. It was yeah. war radio. There was no scope to play. No. And after 45, he realized that he was too senior to be coming up and speaking. So, I mean, uh, that explains why he sort of uh, kept uh, away from it. Because by 1945, all the radio had matured into a powerful instrument. Had matured, but it was not so in 1937. Exactly. Exactly. That's, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, as, as I'm writing in the, in the book, I'm writing. I really, I focus mm-hmm. exactly on that on the war years because, in many ways, uh, you know, the the argument goes that the the war made the BBC too, and I think the war made All India Radio too, uh, except that during the war. And under the British, um, you know, they, they were not fighting, uh, you know, for for the Indians. You know, they were fighting against them. But but anyway, go, going back to the question, just to add to what Johar said, you you know, you're right. I think Gandhi began the the the, the beginnings were not auspicious. You know, as so many biographers have noted, he could um, he could barely open his mouth when he did his first, you know, when as a lawyer, he was making his first defense in Rajkot. He could barely open his mouth and I think his client lost the case. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, he wasn't exactly a star speaker. And so it came slowly to him. And I think he it really it genuinely helped him to not be in India, to be in South Africa, where he was exposed to a whole range of media and communication systems, which perhaps were not at that point available in Gujarat, you know, where he would have been if he hadn't left. And I think being and I'm and I'm discussing this in, in my forthcoming book, the fact that he was in this sort of international milieu really helped him. He was a good, quick learner. He developed the art of speaking, but it didn't come easily to him. You're right to say that. Um, but I think it's very striking that whenever you see Gandhi talking, he doesn't really have notes with him, does he? He doesn't have any paper with him. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, I have tried, I've seen whatever footage I could get. He's usually, he's usually looking down if he's being interviewed because he doesn't like to make eye contact because he doesn't appreciate the camera. But the interesting thing is he never says no. He could tell, he could push the cameraman away and say, I'm not going to do it. And this is very interesting because in 1946 and 47, a very famous American photographer, a lady called Margaret Bork White, um, you know, who visits India and she follows Gandhi and she has some of the most iconic photographs of Gandhi. You know, I don't know if, if you if you all have images of Gandhi in your mind, but there is one from 1946. Um, and, you know, there's so many, uh, so many iconic ones. But there's one from 46 where you see Gandhi in the background and the Charka in the front. And that sort of epitomizes and the light is streaming in. Anyway, she she is a genius with, with the camera. And she writes in her memoirs that though Bapu was never welcoming, and in fact, uh, Bap, uh, Gandhi said, referred to Margaret Bork White as the torturer. He called her the torturer. Uh, whenever she appeared with her camera lens. She she notes that though he said that, he never stopped her from taking photographs. So the interest so that is that is where the pragma the pragmatist comes in. That's where the the astute canny politician comes in. Because image, you know, they say the image speaks louder than words, it's worth a thousand words, you know, the image is worth a thousand, all those cliches. Well, Gandhi totally understood that. And lots of 
people have written about this um, very eloquently. You know, there are, lo there are lots of books about this. Um, but thank you for your question. Sandesh Zaid, uh, I think it, this is connected to the uh, response we just gave. Uh, can we use radio to criticize the government nowadays as Gandhi used it earlier is Sandesh's question. Uh, would either of you like to take it? You mean, this is a question about contemporary, contemporary India, is it? Yes, contemporary India. Um, well, I mean, all I can, I'm going to pass this baton to, to our contemporary expert, which is Johar. But I just want to say, you know, if I can make a plea um, uh, as a totally disinterested person, that can I, you know, if you look at the statistics post-independence in India, you see the role of particularly the transistor radio. You know, all of perhaps a lot of you are too young. Um, I mean, I, I, I am too, I'm speaking historically, but this idea of a villager with a transistor radio to his years, you know, plowing the field. I've seen photographs in, for example, Life magazine from the 1950s India about that. You know, so there was a revolution in India after independence, which was in terms of communications. And radio really led the field. And very soon, if you look at the statistics, I've got them somewhere, uh, the, you know, the, the situation under the British was totally reversed. Um, and even today, if you look at radio's access, you know, we're talking about almost 100%. Uh, I could be wrong, but almost 100% uh, coverage um, and access. And I think if I could make a plea um, for a revival of the, I think, much, uh, you know, sidelined old technology of, uh, of radio in India. I know social media and all the rest of it is all very, very important. And we're all slaves in India and elsewhere, dare I say it, to that. But let's not forget um, the humble transistor radio. I think in India, um, this could be, it could be revolutionary again as a medium. And the I transistor comes in uh, later than that. It comes in around 62, 63. 62, okay. And okay. that revolutionized India because it suddenly democratized radio. Everyone okay. could own one with four fat batteries and one right. called Ariel, you had every pawn shop blaring out Hindi film songs. Right. Every pawn shop from, uh, from Lungle in Mizoram to Kanyakumari, this happened. But before that, I mean, I don't know, but if just little time, I must come in with the squip. When we spoke about the All India Radio and the Second World War, it was actually not the All India Radio that was the target of the Brits. They set up another radio station in Colombo, mm. high on a hill, with three very powerful transmitters, and it was yeah. a South Asia, South Asia Command. Southeast Asia Command. Southeast Asia Command, railway, railway where counter-propaganda was done. Mm. Incidentally, in 1945, they had no utility for it. They were looking for sellers, somebody to farm buyers. And <laughs> finally... Ceylon or Sri Lanka was persuaded to take on this white elephant. And they in turn needed some solvency, some return on cash because it's power casting. And that is where you got Radio Geetmala coming in. Uh, Binaka Geetmala coming in. Binaka uh, music coming in. And this was a perfect uh, antithesis to what was happening in All India Radio, which was looked after, which was commanded by a very conservative minister called B.V. Keskar, who popularized classical music, Shastriya Sangeet, and banned Hindi film music. So Hindi film music moved to Amin Sayani and Binaka Mala, thanks to those transmitters that were lying unused. That had to be put to some utility. And then this again conveys itself. Vivid Bharati comes up as a response. And Hindi film music penetrates barriers that Hindi coteries were struggling to.
So it's it all tied up with one is to the other, and then the transistor further spreads it. Every panwala everywhere was nodding his head while he was mixing his pans. So that's how it all happens. I mean, not, yeah. not just about entertainment, the door. I think mm -hmm. maybe the gentleman's question was uh, was also directed at more you know issues to do with. With, with the political nation. Um, I, and also, I think, can I just quickly say, I think what I was trying to say was also in terms of social and economic issues, you know, for example, I know this happened in the past. So I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't know what, it, what the state is at the moment, but why not use uh, radio for things like rural um, I, education? Um, is, is there anything like that happening in India? A terrific. A, a, a huge, villages? huge amount of it is keeps happening. It was actually agriculture, the agricultural revolution yeah. that brought in the radio in a big way or the other way around. Correct. I was trying to avoid the gentleman's question okay, because sorry. I no no because I'm known to be utterly tactless. Having no, survived, don't, don't. no no, but I'll I'll answer it now that you've got me. Oh sorry it's, sorry no no. no. So there is no freedom of dissidence over all India radio. It wasn't there during my time as well, because even after I had uh, coached the DG and others to be a little more tolerant, they would still slip off somebody who made a statement against the then government. And now this thing has been taken to the point of a fine art. The crushing of dissidence is now a fine art so we can we can there is no freedom of uh, expression in that sense of the term the community radios my god we keep a gestapo type watch over community radios even they can't relay local news even they can't relay local news what i have tried to explain to government is why are you concentrating on the radio and the social media can get you anywhere anytime I mean, like, if you are thinking that X is a subversive message, X is not a good message to be given, X will come through social media. So your ban on community, your restrictions on community radios giving local news is not logical. Who's there to listen? I'm one of the many. So anyway, it's... Uh, that's interesting, no because that's what Gandhi said, didn't he? Um, mm -hmm. At one point, he said, you know, it was to that effect that, you know, uh, when Patel said to him in 46, when he was mm -hmm. a minister in the interim government, and Gandhi said, but why should I do it? Because the people who really need to listen to this won't be able to. Yes. But his, his reasons were different, of course. His reasons mm -hmm. were just access and financial, not political. Gandhi had his base. So, any other questions? Yes. Um, Sumati Ramaswamy uh, thanks you, Chandrika, for the interesting talk and wonders whether uh, one other reason to account for Gandhi's ambivalence could be that uh, the radio at that time did not allow for dialogue, uh, which, as one knows, was Gandhi's favored mode. mode, favored of mode. No, uh, thank you, Sumati. I, I think. I think you're the same Sumati we met in Heidelberg, but, but even if you're not, hello, and thank you for your question. Um, I do write, in fact, about exactly that point in my chapter. So if you do, you know, if you are interested and in get hold of the book, you will be able to follow it. I, I do make that point precisely in one of the, in, in the details. I'm sorry I couldn't cover it all in my talk. You're absolutely right. I write, as I write, I say that, Gandhi felt that he was being stuck in an, uh, a studio, an impersonal studio, being surrounded by worried looking technicians. And this mic thrust in front of him wasn't exactly conducive to that kind of personal rapport that Gandhi always uh, center staged. And in fact, this argument has been made uh, by so many other people, people like, you know, Danendra Pandey and others, you know, who rightly point out that why did all the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people go to listen to Gandhi when he was making a speech in a Maidan, even though he had a speaker in front of him, 
It was not possible for more than 100, 200 people just around him to actually hear his words. The speakers, you know, before you had loudspeakers everywhere, but just so the reason why people went uh, was because they wanted to get darshan. They wanted to get, they wanted to see Gandhi. And I argue in my uh, chapter that the reverse was also true. For Gandhi too, to be able to talk, to emote, to convey his, uh, his uh, you know, everything he wanted to, he needed that communion with the masses, which he couldn't get stuck in an inanimate studio surrounded by technology. So I do make that point, and I'm really grateful for you to ask that question so that it allows me a chance to talk about it. So thank you very much, Sumathi. Um, Theodore Bhaskaran um, asked that you mentioned Gandhiji watched a film uh, in, in, in your um, lecture. What was the film he saw and his dislike was cinema is proverbial? Yes, ah, uh, good question. I'm, you know, it's in my, it's in, it's in my book. <laughs> um, the film was yeah. I got. I think it was, it was in 1944. It was in May, and it was just on the outskirts when he was recuperating uh, on the outskirts of uh, Bombay. Um, um, and I've got the details in the book. Um, I can't remember the name of the film, but it was one of the. Uh, it was a take on um, an Indian classic. <laughs> a traditional classic and the uh, and and people who were watching the film with him um remarked about how gandhi was looking everywhere except at the screen how the length of the of, you know because films i think still are quite long in india aren't they? and the, you know this was quite a long film and gandhi just didn't have the patience or the interest um, and uh, those watching the film with him uh, said that he remarked on you know how how this was such a <laughs> this was such a waste of time um, but but if you if you look at I, I'm sorry I, I need to go and look at my notes in my book to get you the name of the film but I could do it if you emailed me I could let you know um, Sharad Nayak asks you to please throw some more light on the point you made as to how Gandhi was anti-Raj, but not anti-British. Yes, I think the point I was trying to make was one made by Gandhi numerous times, you know, throughout his, uh, throughout his career. Uh, from when he first came to London as a young student, he had lots of friends who were uh, British, uh, very close friends, and many of whom, you know, he kept in touch with. And then, of course, when he went to South Africa, you know, we've got the very famous example, of course, of um, Reverend um, Andrew, um, gosh, uh, I can't believe I've forgotten. Um, Johar, you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reverend uh, Andrew, uh, I can't believe it. Uh, anyway, hang on, hang on, hang on. He, I'm had getting lot, sick. <laughs> he had a lot of friends who were British who often agreed with them, but on many occasions, they agreed to disagree. Um, and we noticed that Gandhi always kept the door, as he, as he wrote, of communication open. He instinctively preferred negotiation to, act, to, to fighting, you know, he, to, 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 you know he, he preferred diplomacy to taking up arms. He was always trying to find a way out through discussion. Um, you know, you notice this time and time again, whether it's viceroys like Lord Irvin, who said that, you know, he disagreed with Gandhi, but profoundly admired the man. And I think the same applied to Gandhi. Gandhi disagreed with Irvin's uh, political role as viceroy, but profoundly admired Irvin. And I think one of the things he admired Irvin for was um, his, his religiosity, uh, you know, the fact that he was a, a devout Christian. Of course, we know that Gandhi almost converted uh, to Christianity um, uh, himself, you know, in, 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 in when he was young. And, and of course, he he didn't, but religion was important. So in short, I think what Gandhi throughout his life 
wanted to do was to separate uh, the, the person from the, the institution of the Raj. The institution was satanic, not the individual. Though, of course, in many cases, the, the link was quite tenuous. Um, and when that happened, Gandhi was against the individual too. For example, very famously, uh, General Dyer, um, you know, at the time of the Jallianwala Bagh uh, massacre. So Gandhi allowed every individual the right to disagree with him, um, uh, as long as it was kept civil and they could have a negotiation. And I think he profoundly believed that diplomacy and negotiation and conversation um, and communication was the way, was the better way. Um, and he only ever took the step of civil disobedience and non-cooperation as the last resort. Uh, just one interjection. The rev, uh, the missionary you were talking about who was very friendly. Now that have become too, I mean, I have my senior moments coming too Andrew, frequently. Reverend Charlie uh, Andrews. Chevin Reverend Char Charlie Andrews. Reverend uh, Charlie Andrews. That's it. No, Reverend Charlie given, Andrews. Yeah. No, this was given to me by Costa Bhattacharya from the audience who felt that uh, I had lost my, you know, whatever was there. No, 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 Reverend Charlie Andrews. No, no, I, I. That's it, Charles Andrews. The, Charles. Yeah, yeah. Freer yeah. Andrews. Charles Free Andrews, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was one of his closest uh, friends Close amongst time. the British, um, you know, and they were like brothers, he said. Um, but there were many, many others. I mean, I think Gandhi's life, if you read, so many great biographers have written, you know, Ram Guha and so many others have written uh, wonderfully about, um, about Gandhi's life. And you will see, you know, how important individuals were to Gandhi. And this is quite an important point to remember. You know, Gandhi was not only about waving to the masses. He was about communing to the individual. Every single individual who ever met him came away saying the same thing. And that was, I genuinely thought that Gandhi was interested in me, in what I had to say, in me as a person. And this was from, you know, the, the poorest of the poor to viceroys and uh, dignitaries. You know, Mountbatten said the same thing, and uh, an American journalist said the same thing, and, you know, an Indian farmer or a laborer said the same thing. And I think this is absolutely astounding in a career as long as Gandhi's. Um, and I, it, it reveals uh, what, uh, what, uh, what skills uh, and what genuine empathy he had. Uh, I, I hope you agree with that. Um, it, it's it's a very it's very difficult, isn't it, to keep that up unless you genuinely were that way. Do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, I, I'm not trying to report, I'm not trying to say that Gandhi was doing this only because he was a good politician. He was that. He was a diplomat. But I genuinely think that he also believed in the sanctity of the individual. Um, and you know that relationship uh, was very important to Gandhi. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, we have just a, about a minute left. So um, I would request you, if you have any uh, concluding comments, Mr. Sarkar and Ms. Kaur. Well, why don't you? Take the floor. No, 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 I'll just, uh, uh, we shouldn't exceed the time. I just want to thank uh, Chandrika for coming up with, with these books uh, every second year or third year. Uh, she works on materials available in uh, the UK and other sources because India is woefully short of archival materials. So that's another problem. And whatever we have, it might as well be... Uh, be affected with the proposed shifting of the National Archives but, uh, or the demolition of the archives building. The main building is supposed to be kept and the rest of it, which actually matters. Whether... So uh, we have a paucity of records and you keep doing a wonderful job. Keep doing a wonderful job. And I really thank the BIC. I think this is the second time I'm uh, participating in any of their program for getting such a wonderful audience consisting of very thinking individuals.
who are here to listen, to understand, and to be stimulated. We all do not need to agree to everything, even if it's information-based, because there are nuances, there are visions that transcend the wealth of information. There are insights. So BIC is doing a wonderful job by stimulating these conversations, and I thank you very much. Uh, Chandrika, it's like back home uh, to you. And uh, well, so thank you I'll... again, and thank you to Bacon and uh, and um, and good evening and and Namaskar. One uh, can't help but uh, wonder um, what uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi would have uh, responded to if if he saw himself in a box on Zoom and with the constant <laughs> "Can you hear me? Can you hear me?" that we do. Uh, I think it is it is it was only. Um, uh, like a like a crystal ball that he said, do I speak into this? Do I do we now speak into Zoom? Uh, <laughs> so much for this fascinating, um, such a, a, a great conversation and a lecture that is so chock full of information, tidbits, and uh, just bits of history that we uh, may have not known about otherwise. Thank you, Mr. Sarkar, for your. Uh, insight and for your masterful analysis uh, as several of our um, audiences have also complimented uh, mr jairaj has complimented on your masterful analysis thank you chandrika we hope to uh, see more of you and uh, uh, see you next time everyone thank you to the audience and uh, good night <laughs>